And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, Come the cre creator of the upcoming Gale Fire campaign setting for fit for D and D fifth edition, the one and only Michael Rookard. How you doing Hello. today, man? I'm good. Thank you. For Feeling good. We're we already already got it funded, and you know we're just uh, trying to get a little higher. <laughs> yep. Con yeah. Congratulations on managing to get twice your initial um, goal at the time of this recording. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a nice uh, surprise. So it's good. Yeah. So, a tradition around here is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Well, uh, let's see. I think that. Well, I mean, when I was a kid, I used to play like Hero Quest and stuff a lot. Uh, and that was probably my first, like, dungeon crawl board game kind of thing that I did. And uh, as I've gotten older, I did a lot of uh, Warhammer, and I did Warhammer RPG as well, the uh, Dark Heresy. And I did that with some friends, and uh, then I kind of got into D&D &D by way of my uh, brother-in-law. And then I've just been playing that since then, pretty much. Uh, and then, you know, I kind of decided that uh, I should I should try to do something of my own. And I had a local publisher uh, kind of ask me about, about doing that. Mm -hmm. So, when it comes to get when it comes to Gale Fire, was this a was this a campaign setting you were doing at your own table that just expanded or? Was there a different um, origin story for this concept? Uh, it's actually my uh, it's actually my book setting because mm -hmm. um, I, I do uh, comics and graphic novels and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had written up like a giant uh, like world document, basically for myself. And uh, when I approached my publisher about doing the book. Uh, you know, he, he kind of picked up on the fact that I mentioned that I had a big design doc, you know, for the world. And he, I guess, I mean, he liked how it looked, and he's like, hey, why don't we turn this into an RPG? And I was like, that sounds like a good, that sounds like a cool idea. We should do that. And so that's kind of how it happened. And I got hooked up with, uh, you know, the rules designer uh, that works for my publisher, and uh, we I had already written a bunch for the setting, and I just ended up expanding it a lot more. And now it's, you know, where the book is today, which is, you know, like a 150-page uh, color book <laughs> mm -hmm. with all kinds of monsters and places to go and airships to get. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty wild. Yeah. Now, with that in, with that in mind, what would you say are some of the uh, some of the ap items that would be on an appendix N within the, within this system or within this um, setting? Sorry. Like, like what are the big important things in the setting? What I mean by appendix N are the t the different media's that served as inspiration for Gale Fire. Whether, oh, yeah. whether that be comic books, whether that be video games, whether that be television, whether that be film. Um, in some cases, I've heard plays. Whether that be music, you get the idea. Yeah, I mean, it's it's probably feeds in from a lot of different places. Uh, like I've been a huge, you know, Final Fantasy fan since I was a kid, playing Final Fantasy three, and I always loved the airships. And uh, you know, I'm really a big fan of fantasy settings mm -hmm. and when I started designing the, the world I was like I want the airships to be like ubiquitous in this world so they're they're all over the place and 
probably you know like uh, a lot of anime I, when i was a kid i used to watch uh tech man blade which i was like had this i'm a big fan of that uh, which is kind of the, the mecca mecca stuff mm-hmm. you remember that one yeah um we've my co-host and i have referenced it quite have referenced it quite a bit as well as as well as its as well as its sequel which wasn't quite necessary but was still good was still good and the fact that um it the lead actor for it ended up breaking two microphones during the recording <laughs> nice yeah so i mean i like that and you know it's uh, this is kind of and i i'm a big fan of uh other kind of like actiony video games and i wanted to kind of see what we could do to bring some of that like stylish action to a board game and see if we could do that uh and i think you know we kind of did with the fame system to get lets you get away with all kinds of crazy stuff uh and you know uh there's you know there's airships and guns and mechs and giant kaiju monsters and it's basically like all my favorite things all, you know, mashed together. <laughs> Which seems pretty silly, but I feel like that's probably how a lot of people approach what they want to write. What they want to write about is they take all those pieces that they like and they put them together with their own spin. Yeah. And just looking at the comic preview that you had um, put on the Kickstarter, I can def- I can definitely see a fair bit of Devil May Cry DNA in- within the work. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I like that uh, <laughs> that crazy, crazy, com- crazy stylish combat. I, I like. I was like, how can I-, I was watching like combo videos on YouTube, and I'm like, how can I draw something like this? Is there a way that I can do that? Mm-hmm. So I did my best, and I'm continuing to do my best with the the graphic novel, which is next on the list of things that we're going to work on to get published because that's already done. I've already got two more big, like sixty more pages finished of that so hopefully that'll be sometime soon after we get this uh this rpg book taken care of yeah now in given how airships are a big are a big damn deal with it within the sh- within the game even, even though they're referred to as skyship well old habits are gonna die hard in this um yeah he uh i the some the the editor for my publisher wrote the the little thing on the, on the Kickstarter page, and I was like, "Should I tell them? Should I tell them that they should call it an airship, or should I just let it stay as a skyship?" I prefer airship, but I believe it is referred to as both within the book. Yeah. Well, in your in your opinion, what it what is the what would you say is the appeal of the of these styles of airships? This idea of doing a class a classic um, galleon style ship just in air instead of on the sea. Well, I mean, uh, they they need the they need the airships to get around because the the uh, land mass is is populated by lots of uh, nasty creatures that uh, make it pretty difficult to travel just by sea or even by land. Um, if we're talking about in terms of style, there's actually several different uh, stylistic versions in the book. Some look like, you know, giant floating submarines. They look like, like you said, the galleon, which is in the cover. And then there's uh, a set that kind of have like a more futuristic vibe. Mm-hmm. And for like the way to put it in the, like, I guess the setting, or what I was thinking was, you know, I always loved watching Star Trek, and I love Mass Effect, and I love that, you know, the party going around and doing stuff on their ship kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I always thought that was, like, really cool, and I was like, how can I do... I actually started my book as a sci-fi, a sci-fi book with, with spaceships and everything. And then I was like, I actually think I want to make a fantasy. How can I do that? And then that's, I was like, I should just make airships. So that's what I did. <laughs> yeah. Which is pr- is pretty fair, and it de- there definitely does seem to be a very, I guess, I guess diesel punk approach that approach that I see in a lot of the 
uh, visual stylings where you're you're have you're having you're having this mix of um, semi-modern tech with magic um, and yeah we got a lot of that there's there's all kinds of like weapons and other stuff that's charged by you know like power cells and which are churned out by some giant you know ancient device within the 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 sky city and you know they have a monopoly on the market for them so that's that's like a ripple for how everybody has to power their their stuff and if you look down if you're on the if you're on the page for um, the Kickstarter the third picture uh, in the preview pictures of the book it has one of the other styles of airships Mm-hmm. It's right above the the preview comic. Yeah, and I'm guessing I'm guessing that when it comes to air, when it comes to airships, there's gonna be a there's gonna be a variety from bit from big full on car- flying carriers to t- to tiny fighters. There are there uh, there's uh, I kind of broke it down like light. Light tonnage, medium tonnage, heavy tonnage, and then there's a super heavy class, which isn't actually. There's one in the book, but you're not really expected to get that. Although a, a creative storyteller could certainly give the players one of these if they wanted to, mm-hmm. which is like a it's a battleship, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, I really, I really hope that I really hope that if that if anybody has brought as anybody if anybody's sunk one of those. That they ended up saying the line. Because <laughs> you know, how how can you how can you not if we're dealing with battleships? <laughs> I know. I, I sunk your battleship. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, there's there's uh, there's uh, several different types, and they all have their own rules and weapons and armor, basically like hit points on different parts of the ship. Um, me and uh, me and my son have played the uh, rules for the airship combat in more like a tabletop setting, uh, and they work pretty good. They work very good. They're very specific on like what you know what you can do. Everybody who's talked to me about the book has been very excited about having actual airship combat rules. Mm-hmm. And. When it comes now, when it comes to when it, when it comes to airship combat, that is that's ship combat is one of those things that is a trick that is a tricky is a tricky affair in a lot of ca- in a lot of cases because um, it's very easy to go way too crunchy with that kind of thing. Oh, for sure. I mean, if you want to, you could probably ease up. There's there's full rules for for engaging with that kind of stuff, but it's probably pretty easy just to we're gonna fly we're gonna fly past this other ship and we're gonna jump off and we're gonna board it. You know, you can just roll to to do that. You don't have to engage with all the the weaponry and all that other stuff. Mm-hmm. So, with the with that with that in mind, um. Given the given the fact given the fact that if I'm not mistaken, a lot of the travel is gonna is gonna be in the air, and you're only going on ground when it comes to dealing dealing with um, demons or or other monsters, or just dealing with the threats within the world. That's yeah. You wouldn't want to you wouldn't want to trek. I mean, as a if you have a group of seasoned adventurers, you know you could you could make a trek on on the ground but it's not particularly safe for you know the every man that doesn't have several levels of stats and weapons behind them they don't want to be out there in the in the wild mm-hmm. so the ne- the next th- next thing I'd want I'd I f- I'd want to ask on that matter is would it be feasible to ru- to run this as a he- as a hex crawl? You know, where you're go where you're going where you're going along your ship along hexes and dealing with different events. I I, I assume you could. Just depends on 
I mean, there's uh, we got maps like with specific air. If you look at that top, that top one, there's a few areas that are quite you know well laid out in terms of uh, like what's on the map, and you could just have a hex grid of your own map and and you know say that these places are these locations and you could probably string a pretty cool story together by doing that yep now with that with that in mind um when it comes to when it comes to what when it comes to what's going to be present for the for the game itself um do you have any plans on putting any any um any subclasses for the base classes out there to reflect the setting? Yes, there are. Uh, there are subclasses. Mm -hmm. Document open just so I can have it in front of me. But there's a Slayer and there is... There, oh, the... Uh, <laughs> it's basically a... Uh, a character that uses... What do we call it? An Aether Tech... Uh, engineer, I think that's what we called it. We had to, you know, we changed a few things as we were working on it. But it's basically like a, a you know, like a, like a gunner class. You know, they have big guns, big cannons. There's a little uh, short story of you know a, a crazy dwarf talking about his six barrels of hot death <laughs> in the book that I wrote. Um, and then there's the Slayer, which they have a bunch of bonuses to fight the big the big baddies. So basically they get bonuses against huge or larger creatures. Which, that, cer that certainly makes sense. Um, I'm... Since, since, since one of the big things is that you mentioned was trying to bring in that um, sense of stylishness, given the... Given the uh, impact that Devil May Cry has has had. I'm curious how you how you plan on bringing that into the do the rule set of Fifth Edition. Well, I had a lot of crazy ideas that the rules guy told me that we shouldn't do in the first book, uh, and then we ended up just pretty much going with the fame system, and uh, then you you know you get your. Uh, your special abilities from being like a uh, a slayer or a bounty hunter, mm -hmm. which that is that's a back so that's a optional background. I mean, how many? There's several optional backgrounds. So, uh, what would be the main difference between slayer and bounty hunter? Uh, a slayer. Okay, so here we go. Here's mine. So, okay, the no, nope, that's not it. I'm scrolling around in the document right now, of course. Um, well, so the Slayer is a, is focused on the biggest and baddest weapons for, uh, you know, fighting large creatures, ancient, ancient, it says from taking down ancient evils to city crushing behemoths, which is pretty accurate. And so they get a bunch of, uh, they get bonuses as they level up to, you know, hone in on fighting larger creatures. Like, one of them is, when you're uh, attacking a creature, huge or larger, you deal an additional 1d12 damage. So just, when you're fighting a huge or larger creature, you just do more damage. And then you can use uh, our Slayer weapons are, have bonuses against huge creatures, and are not as good against uh, medium or smaller creatures. And what else? What was it? What else? Oh, the bounty hunter. Mm -hmm. The bounty hunter is a uh, a background. Yeah. Which I I can get. I can I can get I can get behind that I can get behind that certainly. Um. Now with that with that in mind, I'd I'd like to go th I'd like to go through just the base cl the base classes and. And you can tell me if you if that one is going to have a dedicated subclass within the Galefire setting, and just kind of get a feel for that subclass's play style. 
All right. I can try to do that. Okay. So, for and I'm going I'm going in these in alphabetical. So, first barbarian. A barbarian would would probably make an excellent slayer. So that that's probably what you'd get for a fighter in a barbarian would probably be a slayer. It's set in the uh so in this book we have we just have the two subclasses mm-hmm. right now. So we have uh, the Artificer, which gets the Aether Tech Artificer. Mm-hmm. And then we have the uh, Fighter Slayer. But I'm sure you could, you know, do that as a Barbarian as well. I don't see why you could. So, you, so when it comes to the subclasses you have, you, they're not specifically set to one class above others? Uh, I mean, we have it set in here. Uh, so Slayer would go with Fighter... And uh, the Aether Tech Artificer would go with Artificer, mm-hmm. but I'm sure you know, depending on the the person running the game, you could probably use a Barbarian too for the Slayer. I mean, I could see that personally. That's basically what one of my characters is in the book is a Barbarian Slayer. Mm-hmm. Which I can I can certainly get the, I can certainly get that. So. With that, with that in, with that in mind, um, I see, I see that there's quite, there's quite a bit of of interesting, of interesting equipment. Um, when it com- when it comes to, when it comes to some of the, some of the cra- some of the crazy end, end of, um, end of, we- end of weapons and potentially armor, um, I'm get. Are there are is it going to be operating under the standard setup for magic items, or are there a few quirks within Galefire's uses of uses of these um, special items? I mean, I think you would use you could use the standard uh, magical item find table, but I would say for most of the stuff you can get in Galefire, uh, there's this place called. Um, uh, Wow. <laughs> the the Black Sand, which is a flying super airship that is where most uh, bounty hunters and freelancers and pirates call home. Mm-hmm. And on there is a place called the Promenade. And where when you go there, you can pretty much find a majority of the things, uh, mm-hmm. A majority of the items that you can get in Galefire. And then we have a whole bunch of really special uh, weapons and armor that you wouldn't be able to get there, uh, but well, they're one, they're, so they're wondrous items, and uh, we don't specifically have, like, rules on how to acquire them, but I assume, you know, that's that's what I would guess you'd use the standard uh, magical item acquisition rules for. We have like power armor. You know, that's something you could probably buy on the promenade. It's very expensive. It needs to be serviced frequently. But it is, uh, you know, second to none in terms of giving you AC. It gives you an AC of 20, unmodified by dexterity. Mm hmm. And then there's uh, a few different manufacturers of power armor, and they each have like their own little quirk and bonus to them. Yeah, I can I can certainly get behind that. But yeah, the uh, the the special weapons, some of them are uh, very very powerful, <laughs> and you really have to be careful giving those giving those away to the players. Mm-hmm. So, although although so, although some DMs, especially myself, might might be crazy enough to try and try and get try and get try and give try and give players the um very powerful but very dangerous um equipment. Oh well, you'd you'd love the uh, the uh, Ossidian keyword, which is so we have a we have a big. Um, we have a keyword system for the weapons, and uh, so there's called, was it weapon modification? 
and uh, we have keywords for them that make them uh, do different things um, and it changes the price and the repair cost. Mm -hmm. And so when you have an obsidian weapon, which is basically like a golden era weapon, if you roll a one, the weapon will break and it has to be repaired and it is quite expensive, but it also does, uh, it also makes it go up like an entire, like a 2d8 weapon becomes a 3d10 weapon. Mm -hmm. and, and if it's a d12 weapon, it can't actually go higher than that, but that would be pretty wild. Uh, but that, that is a extremely powerful with also, you know, it can break it at a moment's notice. Yeah, and I'm, I'm uh, guessing. I'm guessing that the, the the whole breaking part is handled is handled by a roll. Yeah, it's your hit roll. So if you roll a one on your hit roll, it breaks. Oh, yeah, that'd do it. Oh. <laughs> now within the setting, how is how are mages treated? Is it a case where mages might have might might have issue, or is it is it a case where mages are mostly um, artificers. Um, I would say there is a probably a about an equal, probably about equal amounts of artificers to 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 mages and such in the world. Um, there's a whole the uh, celestial city is uh, run by the mages guild or the adepts guild, um, and there are a lot of mages there, and there's a school for for maging. <laughs> stuff like that um, I mean everywhere uh, there's probably more I would guess there's probably more artificers because just how entwined uh, the technology is with the magic yeah I could I could cert I could certainly see it now with that with that in mind uh, since it's since it's one of the bigger things on how on how it works. Let's go into the fame system and what that would entail. Yes. Uh, so the fame system is basically you gain fame as you uh, level up. Let me go to this section real quick. Everybody will have this PDF soon. <laughs> Where is it? I think I, I think I missed it or something. Well, okay. So the fame system. While I look for it, I can just tell you. Um, the fame system allows you to use your built-up fame that you gained through, you know, adventuring and slaying uh, dangerous monsters to re-roll your dice and a few other. Um, a few other things that I will tell you here in just a moment as soon as I remember where it is in the book. There we go. Here. Wow, how can I not find this? Eighty one. All right. <laughs> The fame system, here we go, okay. So I can tell you exactly what you can do. So you have a certain amount of fame points that you get for, like I said, adventuring and slaying the baddest of the bad monsters. And so with your fame points, uh, you can you can reroll a fail. Uh, you must take the result, though. You can use a fame point to gain 10 pl plus 10 on a skill check. You can double your damage. You can double the effects of a, of a spell. You can automatically or go first on initiative, instantly regain hit points, 
instantly recover from a status effect, remove one level exhaustion, successfully make a death saving throw, or counter any spell of ninth level or lower. So you can use your same points for those things. So that lets you be more aggressive, and if you want to do crazy stuff, you can probably get away with it if you have enough fame points. You start with uh, your level plus 1d6. And then you can gain them by, you know, doing stuff your storyteller puts in front of you and uh, probably slaying giant monsters. Yep. But with now with that in mind with that in mind um within i'm get even though it, i'm guessing that there's going to be di going to be different chapters dedicated to different regions do you plan on putting a um a kind of a gazette kind of a gazetteer to get to get the big bullet points of the setting early on in the book uh yeah and uh, at the very beginning i think that's one of the first sections we go through was a uh basically just uh kind of talks about the various uh it, we got some a history section and then that goes into uh kind of like a like a like a not really a glossary but it goes over you know the main thing main things in the in the setting and uh, then we go into gods and demons and then uh, you get to the nation states and the various regions, and so that those have some art with them, and uh, talks about what you could do in that area, what kind of things, what the basically notable locations in that area, uh, places you could go, things you could see, and then uh, some suggestions of like what a DM could. Uh, might do a DM would would do in this area, and then there are some there's some short stories as well interspersed throughout the the book that kind of is maybe more what you're talking about like the Gazetteer that's I mean this, you're talking about like the the book for uh, Eberron right I think it has the Gazetteer do they all have that Gazetteer is it is a is a catch all it's not it's not one it's not something that um, one setting has o over others. It's just a general thing. Okay, I got you. So, but yeah, I mean, there's uh, it has there's a lot of story and stuff about the setting and the various places you can go. There's a section for every nation state with stuff to do and things to see, and there's a section for every like main region. Uh, with stuff to do and things to see <laughs> and suggestions for things to do mm -hmm. like uh, you know important NPCs or important groups stuff like that as well so you know who you might be working with in that area if you're working there if you're doing you know jobs in that region of the world mm -hmm. and it's got a cool like splash picture for every region and every uh, every region and every uh, every nation state, and let me tell you, those took a while. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so, I'm certain that they pro I'm certain that they probably did, but with. The With that in, with that in, with that in mind, um, I think I think the next th the next thing to ask is do you, is do you have plans on putting in a mini adventure within the book? Uh, we have some uh, we have basically some hooks, uh, but there is not currently a uh, like a a one shot that DMs could run their group through. That might be something, you know, I could probably try to do and that would be something we'd we'd probably release for free uh once once we're done getting the book out. Um I think I had had some ideas for it and we just didn't uh didn't get it in there in time to have like a one shot. Um That would have been nice to do though. I would have I would have liked to do that. So maybe we will. I I'm with I try to do that. 
I might try to put that together. I've got a few ideas for uh, something like an adventure on the black sand. I had I had some notes written down for for what I would do for that. That would kind of uh, take the the party through and kind of introduce them to some of the areas and uh, the more uh, the deep dive regions that are more fleshed out than some of the other regions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can I can certainly get behind that. So with with that in, with that in mind, um, as I as I understand it, you get you guys are shooting for uh, for about um, one hundred and sixty pages. It is. It is. Uh, I have the document open right now. It is one hundred and fifty nine pages. <laughs> close en- close enough. Oh. Um, now, what what would you guys be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date per se, just a ballpark. I have been told that the PDF may be available when the Kickstarter wraps up. <laughs> so, hopefully, relatively soon after the end of the Kickstarter, you will be able to download your PDF. And then, you know, the I'm not exactly. I'm not sure on the printing side. Uh, I've been assured that will be that will go smoothly, so I, I certainly hope it does. But yeah, I mean, not it shouldn't be too long. I told some people because uh, I know we had a placeholder date in there for December. I it will be before it will be before December. All right, I can get I can get behind that, and I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it how it develops with time. Yeah, I mean, uh, we we talked about you know like uh, we if this does well, you know, I'm I would I'd love to keep you know making more, do some more deep dives on uh, some more regions to adventure in. I mean, there's a bunch that would be very you know ripe for for doing that and I know that the rules guy wanted to do like put in more airships you know more different airships maybe ways to customize your airships that might be something people enjoy (laughs) and something I would enjoy Mm -hmm. so I mean yeah uh, it's going well and I I plan on uh, continuing to work on it for sure Yep, and like I said I'll be looking forward to it but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Oh yeah, you're welcome. I'm glad to do it. Yep. And any time you see fit to return, whether it's further Galefire or or whatever we whatever um, form of shit posting we end up doing, um, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness and there will be plenty more where that came from as there always is here on the open bar of the internet but until then on behalf of the good brothers present and not present my name is Mildra I am your gaming monk stay Fucking frosty, everybody!